how do we connect nature journaling with other lessons and other activities? Use it as sort of a more broad tool. How can we have it be a part of um, other lessons? Hold on, I need to, okay, good. Thank you, Avea, for taking care of the waiting room. Um, how can we have it sort of supplement things and in that the sort of the arc of the broader learning context, where can we, we put that in? Um, we want to explore that. When I was working on the book, How to Teach Nature Journaling with Emily Ligren, one of the things we looked at really carefully is, um, is this, we have these nature journaling activities and is that, is that the, the, the full lesson? And um, what we generally came to, the idea was, was, was no. No, it's not. Um, what we want to do is to think about nature journaling as an adjunct that supports and reinforces these other things. A useful tool that you can use in lots of different ways. But if you're going to say, I'm going to teach all of my um, science through nature journaling, there's probably a lot of stuff that is going to end up left on the cutting room floor that would be really useful. Um, and so how can we use that, intentionally use that, that nature journaling experience to enhance other sorts of things? Um, and let's perhaps get started by thinking, um, uh, <clears throat> if, maybe what we could do is, um, let, let's let, let me I'll, I'll get people started with an idea. So here's here's one way that nature journaling can come in. In science classrooms, more and more now, we're looking towards teaching from phenomena. So rather than just lecturing to people, kids are involved investigating something, and um, there's a there's a real thing that you're looking at and you're trying to figure out. Nature journaling is an awesome way with whatever phenomena you bring in at the start of a lesson um, to get students to engage with it, to really look at it carefully and to begin to think about it. So let's say you're going to be doing a, um, a, a, a lesson on, uh, on life cycles of plants. You could start with a nature journaling activity. You've got a number of life cycle activities. For instance, there's the, the nature journaling activity where you, um, you take one plant and you follow it through time. Same plant, different stages. You can also, um, in a single day, go out and here's your field of nasturtiums. You're going to draw yourself a nasturtium. Can you find one that's a little bit younger and less developed? And I can put that, you know, draw a diagram, take notes about that. Can I find one that's even younger? And then you kind of try to trace it back in time. Like what is the earliest sort of proto nasturtium that you can find? And then what about the other direction? Can you find it sort of wilted, very wilted? Then what happens when the leaves fall off? And then what happens as this fruit starts to develop? You can sort of track that through time, but you can do that you know, in the, the course of a single day, you're not looking for one plant to change and you're on that plant's timeline, but you're looking at the different stages and trying to figure out where each one comes in the order. And actually something that's really interesting on that um, is you'd think that that'd be pretty straightforward, but the common dandelion that is in every park everywhere, the common dandelion actually has this little nuanced step in its development that nobody expects and um, really can confuse and throw people off. It's really fun. So if you do this with a common dandelion, um, sparks will fly and that's, that's fun. There'll be this, this extra little moment in there like, but it does this thing. I didn't know that. Um, but you can see how either of those, <laughs> either of those, um, would be a great kind of way of launching into this study of, 
of plant development. And then everybody has this sort of common ground, this sort of common experience that they can draw from but to help them be participate in the discussion. Doesn't mean that that's your entire lesson, your entire unit, but it's a wonderful way to start um, and to kind of refocus and, and re-energize people um, perhaps partway through a lesson as well. Um, so I'd love to hear from you folks, um, have, is there anybody here who has used nature journaling as a part of a larger unit and how you use that to kind of um, sort of where you use that in that, that unit, how you connected it to other things that you were doing? What did you find it particularly good for? And um, what was it not as useful for where you felt like, you know, I need to kind of do these other non-nature nature journaling things to, um, to, to, to reach these other teaching objectives that I have. If you're new to this Nature Journal Educators Forum, the way we kind of get people's attention is um, sometimes you can just speak up. Everybody's able to unmute themselves. If it seems we're having a problem with a lot of people talking over each other, then you can either, if you look down, there's that reactions button on the bottom of the screen and you can uh, hit that and see that little hand that just went up in the corner of my screen. That's the raise hand button. And I got that, I clicked on reactions and I could raise and lower my hand there. Um, another thing you can do is just kind of go like this and we will be um, also watching the gallery view and you wave at us and we're kind of like, oh, you've got something to say. And between all those different ways of doing it, uh, we hope to get to everybody. Um, so does anybody have any thoughts, comments or ideas about nature journaling in the context of your other lessons and the uh, other learning objectives that you have. Uh, let's jump over to Sandra um, and then uh, Katya. Um, now, let's see, where did Sandra go on my screen? There we are. So Sandra, I'm going to spotlight you. Thank you so much for being with us today. Good to see you again. Oh, and at your recommendation, Sandra, you're currently muted. Um, I, we have a workshop coming up, um, which will be talking about engaging elders with nature journaling as you suggested. So that will be a topic for a full nature journal educators workshop. Thank you so much for that suggestion. And that will be very useful. So you can unmute yourself. There you go. Um, I didn't handle lessons by myself, but I worked with a learning disabilities teacher in elementary school and we did plants. And it, um, these kids, it was the suburbs, but these kids lived and most of them lived in a, a low income apartment. So they, they were not out in the grass very often or planting gardens, but it was amazing to see this one child grow his first ever string beans. And when they, they came up, the string beans were tiny, tiny, but there was a, a little cluster of them. And he couldn't believe they were real, that, that that was really string beans. And he carried that plant home to show his parents that he could grow string beans. It was, it, it was an, a, an amazing response that when you realize that uh, these kids that live in urbanized areas have so little contact with things that are growing, let alone nature journaling, just to be able to see a seed they plant grow and bloom and produce fruit or vegetable. Yeah, it's so true. It, it's, it is profound. Um, the, the, the connection that you get with, um, you know, here you've got this little Dixie cup <laughs> with a little bean sprout sticking out of it. And, and we, because of the attention that that student gives to that cup, that little bean sprout becomes so special. I've been um, raising some Buckeye um, seeds in my house and spending all this time looking at them. And I love these little Buckeyes. One of them's sick right now. And I'm having a hard time sleep because I'm worried about my little Buckeye. Um, but being able to be responsible for 
a little living thing like that it, it's that's a that's a everybody re, i remember my little bean in a cup from elementary school and you're right and then you think about the impact of that on somebody from a from a resource, resource limited environment that's huge that's huge and then the, then then you can then with if you're doing that being in the cup activity we can be nature journaling with that as a part of that but that that being in a cup activity is this whole other responsibility and stewardship thing and the nature journaling helps us pay more attention along the way that's a that's an example of a really great activity to connect with nature journal um let's bring um katya in on this conversation um uh, hey there good to have you with us how are you doing uh by the way i was watching your presentation for sketchbook revival oh. so that's my project for the day um i don't come to nature nature journaling is fairly new to me as a concept but the more i learn about it, the more i'm like oh we used to do this we used to do that um i teach small children so a lot of what i would do is collaboratively na collaborative nature journaling so when we would go to plant because five-year-olds four and five-year-olds don't generally write especially not in urban areas um you know lower income they don't um but regardless so we would do it as a collaborative thing and so we would I brought in a bag of beans and I said we're going to plant some beans and they go well, you know they never thought of the concept and what we did is that everybody got their own plant and I'll explain that in a minute but we wrote about what do you think will happen when we put it into some soil what do you think will happen what has to happen first we had talked about the parts of a plant and they couldn't see a root, they couldn't see a stem, they couldn't see leaves, they couldn't see flowers. So where are they? So we talked about, and so what I did is I made a big KWL chart, know, wanna know, and learn, and what I learned. So, tell, um, so this is the KWL? What I know, what I want to know, and what I learned. Right, so that's also so we started of assessing what they know at the start of an activity. Right, because that way you're, you're meeting them where they are. And so you had kids who mom planted a garden and you know they knew they had, a, I had a lot of students who came from rural Mexico and rural Central America. They grew up on farms. They knew plenty about it, more than I do. Um, so we start with what they know. And I would chart who, you know, the kids would give me their sentence. I know that the seed holds everything inside. I know this is a lima bean seed because my mom buys these. Um, and so we charted what they knew. Then we went to what they want to know. What do you want to know about a seed growing? And then after a while, we would check back and we would add things as we were learning them. And there might've even been things that they would learn the first day. Like you can't just put a bean on the table and expect anything to happen. Um, but what we did with, the, with it and I wanted the kids to be able to see everything is I took a little piece of damp paper towel, lay the bean on the paper towel and put it in a plastic Ziploc bag and hung it on the windowsill. So they could, you know, not the windowsill, but the window so that they could take a look at it every single day. And for a few days, nothing. And then all of a sudden they started to notice that the, 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 the outside of the shell started to, the outside of the bean started to wrinkle and then pretty soon it would start to push out a, a little white thing that they rec that we recognized as being the stem of the root. And then after a couple more days that would start getting longer and all of a sudden coming from the other end, what would start, what would become the stem started pressing out. But this way they could see step by step, really simple, but they could see everything. And then once they had established a root system and, um, and a few leaves and a stem, we would take them and we would transplant them to, I transplanted them to the little plastic, uh, see-through plastic cups. That way they could see root work as they were growing Good it. Idea. Good idea. And what I would also do is I would get like um, a very simple, like one of those, uh, what do you call them? Like a, like a snack tray, a clear plastic snack tray so that they could see 
and I would take a little piece of sponge, put a seed on top of the sponge, and then they would watch different seeds grow so that they could see that the bean went faster than the radish or went, you know, and so they could look at various seeds growing and then look at root structures. And were they, all at once. and they, they were then documenting this along the side. We were, we, well, we were doing it as a group documentation. Mm -hmm. The kids would come up and they would go, I see this happening. Okay. And so we would figure out what is happening. And then we would put it on our KWL chart, which was always enormous. It was always like two foot. No, it was usually about three foot by three and a half foot. It was big. That's cool. The, uh, so. yeah, yeah, being able to record change through time is uh, one of the magical things about, um, uh, about, hold on a second. Um, it, one of the really sort of ma magic tricks that you can do in a nature journal. Right. We're, we're, we're stuck in time and slow change we cannot observe because our brain doesn't, we don't kind of like, ooh, movement, you just did something. Um, but you can come back to it later that day and bam, there's a change. Um, and, you know, diagramming those in your journals, that's, that's, a, that's a wonderful approach. Right. And one of, one of the other things, because um, uh, San Sandy, Sandy talked about uh, not having nature in urban areas. Actually, there's quite a lot of nature. It may not be what we want to call nature, but I have never lived any place where there aren't squirrels running around telephone wires. Much as I don't really want them around, there are rats. Um, I found a dead, my, dead mouse outside my classroom uh, several years back. Um, there's always some kind of weed pushing through the concrete. So there's actually a lot of nature. You just have to look a little bit harder. But it's there. So I, I agree with your definition of nature. Um, the working definition that I use for nature um, is the observable material physical world around you. So I'm not saying nature as opposed to human made, because I consider humans part of nature. Right. Um, I'm using the term natural as opposed to, say, um, supernatural. So the things that I cannot observe, um, if, there is, if there is something that I cannot observe, measure, interact with, then I, as sort of as a scientist, I'm, I'm out of luck. I'm out of my, my the, the realm of what I can explore using my, my observations and the tools that fall out from that. Right. And, no, I was just kind of bringing that up for the yeah. fact that there are people, because you don't think about the fact, but there are nature. You can hear a bird. Um, it may not be this beautiful parrot. It may not be, um, uh, what did we draw yesterday? Um, the cock hen. It might just be a pigeon, but that is nature. It's got the characteristics of other birds. So it gives you a, a launching point for nature journaling. And you can always bring in a fishbowl, you know, there's always that. Oh, that's any living thing kind of ups the game. I want to bring um, uh, Ayoka in on this, if that's okay. Absolutely. Uh, to to sort of share uh, things that you're doing with these ideas and sketch noting. Hi there. <laughs> I, I saw your, your 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 note in the the comments there, and just sort of wanted to. To, 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 could, could you flesh this, that out for us a little bit more and uh, share some of those ideas and thoughts? Um, yeah, so, so I'm a speech therapist by training, but I'm, um, I'm veering off into visual, visual communication at the moment. So that's exciting. And um, uh, I'm actually teaching my first workshop for colleagues. So I'm bringing speech therapy and sketchnoting together, which is super exciting for me. So I'm not, this, in Germany, speech therapists are not in schools. So we have, we are in private practices. It's a very different system to the US. So, yeah. Um, I'm just, I've been, when I finished school, I wanted to be a, a, a teacher in like an alternative school system because my school was super traditional and German education, I think is much less open-minded still than US. 
at least from what I hear from <laughs> you guys. It isn't that, that open-minded yet. We're working on it. Yeah. Well, but you guys are. <laughs> so I've been, I've, been, uh, I've been listening in on some of your conversations on YouTube and I've just been, I had this kind of desire to, to I, I, I love teaching and I love thinking about how to teach. And uh, I just listening to you guys, uh, you guys ideas just lights me up. It's just oh, so nice to, you. yeah, just, it's so, so lovely. It brings me back to the time when I was like, I want to, I want to do this differently, but I don't know how yet. So after many, many years, I'm kind of returning to that point and teaching sketch noting and thinking about how to teach it and how to integrate it with what the people already know or where they come from, what their background is. That's super important to me. So I'm not kind of, uh, I don't want to teach them something else, but I want to help them understand that what, what you can use these tools for is your everyday life, be that, you know, communicating with small children with speech difficulties or with, uh, with from foreign countries that they don't speak German well, or be it with being a speech therapist or be it with being a teacher or learning in school. I, it's such a versatile, versatile thing. And maybe eventually I'll teach some nature, nature journaling too, but I'm learning at the moment. So it's nice to not teach and just learn. So what, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm getting from you, I wanna make sure I understood this correctly. So you're using aspects of sketch noting and putting these into sort of um, active conversation with students who are having speech difficulties, either because of a, learning a new language or a developmental thing or for some other reason. And yeah. so you're bringing aspects of, 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 of journaling and sketch noting into just sort of the regular flow of your, of your classroom experience. Yeah. So to me, what my, my, my take on sketch noting is not just taking notes where it comes from, like Mike Brody invented it for taking notes, but I call it, I call it picture language in German, which is like, you can use this as a language is universal. It's not as clear, like it's not as concise as spoken language because it's just a little bit smaller, but it's such an old concept of transmitting ideas. And it's amazing if you use it like freely and don't, it's also the don't be perfect, just, you know, draw something. It, yeah, in the same way that you would do, if you plan a garden, you would sit down with somebody else and talk about it. And there's a bush here and we have a flower bed on this, this side. You can do the same with other things if you talk about relationships or feelings or stories like I have I had a little I worked in a school for a while with uh, handicapped kids uh, and I had a little girl with down syndrome <laughs> and we found a spider in the in the wash basin and she freaked out like a spider a spider so she couldn't speak very well but we got the spider and we took it in a cup and we brought it outside and then I sat her down and said we have to write this down for your teacher so he knows what what happened and she could almost not sit down she was like so excited. So we, I sat her down, we, we drew the whole story. I wrote next to it because then the teacher understands. I kept her in my classroom for like the next 20 minutes. And then she, we went to the teacher. She ran into the classroom, said in German, it's Spinne, but she couldn't say it. She said Pinne. So she said Pinne, 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 Pinne. So we told the story and she couldn't, she couldn't tell at this point what the spider, like where's the spider now? She couldn't answer. She couldn't say what we had done really, but it was there. And then it hung in the classroom for a week. Next week I came back, she could tell me everything where the spider is now, what we did, where the spider was before. Like the whole story was just there. Yeah. yeah so this is like one example. Really kind of focus somebody and kind of grab their 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 attention the 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 process of using those words and those pictures together yeah. is such a glue there's the 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 dual coding theory of learning sort of basically the uh, your speech is being you'll probably know this a lot more of it but there's a lot of sort of speech areas kind of laterally in here and visual areas back here in your brain and so when we're doing these the we're putting both of these together we're activating different parts of our brain and sort of having the learner both create their own sketch notes as this is going along. So you're saying that so the teacher can be, as you're discussing something, 
drawing icons and sketch note elements on the board. So the students are getting the sort of facilitated visual experience along with what they're getting through auditory or interaction. And then the students are doing the same sort of things you're then in, in their note taking. Yeah, it's my and, big dream to bring this more into the schools because that yeah. gives the permission. Like if you had a teacher like that when you were little, you would have had a whole different experience of school if you were allowed to, you know, do visual notes and know that's a thing. So, so what, what, what is, what's really cool about this is that this idea was totally off of the radar of what I was thinking about what we would be talking about in this. And that's why we have these forums. Because like you come in here with this, and now, as I'm sitting here thinking about it, I'm like, oh, of course, this is what you need to be doing, right? This wonderful way that, that so you can have journaling off uh, as, as its own little activity on the side. It can be something, a nature journaling activity that can be something that um, I was originally thinking of like, you know, you could you know, do this at the start to kind of introduce a topic or then to reinforce some concept along the way as this little activity. But you're saying, no, this can be, a, this sort of visual thinking can be a tool that you're weaving through the entire class from day one till the, the kids go. As you're kind of communicating things, you're also incorporating visual images and icons and those sort of things with it. And you could also be teaching the kids how to do that themselves. Yes. Yeah. And, and I've, I've been thinking a lot about the difference between nature journaling and sketch noting, as in nature journaling is like, because you draw, you look so, you get, it's very, you, you, you get slow and you look at things very closely, whereas sketch noting is more a fast activity and it's more about, this is about symbols, it's not about what's there, it's about the, the easiest symbol you can think about. So it, it has differences, but also I'm relating a lot to your discussions here because I'm thinking about visual learning and also integrating, you know, writing and and drawing and and colors and all these things that you teach. There's there's a, there's a great like there's a great overlap, but there's also some differences between yeah. the two. Um, let, let's uh, bring Aisha in on this. Thanks, Jack. Hi, Ayoka, that made me just want to jump in on something. Um, the school I used to be at, uh, we were Reggio inspired as well as an international school. But one of the things they talk a lot about in Reggio, which was really appealing to me, is that children have a hundred languages. And so we automatically preschool through eighth grade consider drawing an essential part of communication in every class. Right? Isn't that exactly? And hand symbols and the body. And I hope someday that school develops drama as well. It was a piece missing. Um, but we at least had a lot of the drawing and talking and writing as a valid form of communicating and a way you could be assessed uh, for anything because we were stuck in the assessment world. Um, the other thing I wanted to share, I started looking at this, what's the topic two days ago, which was like, ooh, let's think about this angle. Um, and of course, lots of stuff came up for me, including, oh, I did nature journaling as part of my photosynthesis lessons, like we're going to sketch leaves, we're going to understand roots, water transport, like here, because here's where we're just going to pull in the natural journaling or pollination or adaptations, you know, whether we're studying flight, then we just journal my feather collection, or whether we're um, studying fire adaptations, we might nature journal a redwood seed cone or something like that, you know, just always bringing it in again and again, as opposed to I never had a unit on nature journaling. It was just like, let's bring in that tool now because uh, it fits. But the other piece, and I feel like that's kind of obvious to all of us who have to teach science in particular, you know, we make those connections if we want them to draw. But the other thing I wanted to sort of throw out there is I was looking again at NGSS, which is the National Science Standards, and I'm remembering my environmental ed program, they really wanted me to support the science program. And I know some of you have been hearing me say this now for a few weeks. So I kind of went that angle a lot. 
and I became the holder of the science standards and GSS. And I realized it includes one of the practices you're supposed to be making sure they develop is models, developing and using models okay. and drawing and labeling is a model. And then also communication, being able to communicate information as a scientist. I was like, there's so many ways I can keep validating nature journaling. And that was the science practices. But then I was looking at the cross-cutting patterns, which, and that includes cross-cutting concepts, right? Which is science concepts and history concepts. And that's the beauty, right? The big picture stuff you're getting students to look at. And I was just looking up right now and it's like patterns is part of me, it. And when you're nature journaling, you're often spotting patterns that you might not have. Mm -hmm. Like I got, I got lost in the nectar lines of a blue-eyed grass this morning um, as I applied Jack's petal curling lesson from last week, <laughs> torturing myself. This is really pushing my brain in a way it's not used to going. That, that's, that's, that is, but then you're, you are on your growth edge right there. Totally. So just, and just I realized my growth edge hurt. So I had to stop for two days drawing because it was just like, oh, there's pain there. Let's just wait till it feels good again. And I was like, okay, lost some data, but that's okay. But data collection is part of the science standard. So one can sneak in nature journaling. You're collecting data in a visual form. And if you add numbers to it and then structure and function, scale proportion and quantity yep. you see that see where i'm going with this it's like Absolutely. if you ever need to if, if i ever any of us ever need to find justification for doing more of it in our curriculums there's tons of places it's built in into the science the practices and the cross-cutting patterns so so that was fun thank you i sat and looked at all that and sort of formalized it for myself yeah, the I, I like that. This is a, a really Im, important point um, that this idea of um, that that in the past in 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 science um, in science classes people were uh, you, the the teacher had said like we want you to 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 learn about photosynthesis. Right. Here's some facts about photosynthesis that I want you to, to, to remember. Now, what they're saying is that how you do science has equal weight to the little science factoids that you might be memorizing. So, you know, how do you ask questions? How do you kind of come up with models for thinking about things? How can you um, how can you, how do you get information about things that you're looking at? Um, how do you communicate that to people? So these science and engineering practices are, it used to be that, that science education was, you know, 99% factoids, which we want you to memorize. So now it's one third factoids that we want you to memorize. One third how do you do science? So those, these science and engineering practices. And one third, how do you think like a science? These cross-cutting concepts. And, and teachers are being told that they don't have to pack as many little factoids into their lesson because we're now also teaching these processes and how to do. So we're trying to make our scientists not just um, really good test takers, um, scientists should be makers, right? So how do you do it, right? Are, is, so you're, are, are we talking about science as, as the verb or the noun, right? Mm. So let's go do some science, yo. Um, and the, if you're in a state that has adopted NGSS, the, that practice is intentionally giving you the room to do science, which is nature drill. It's incredibly liberating actually as a teacher to look at these practices and cross-cutting concepts. 
Yeah, and then and then to to also when when you realize that oh these have these now have equal standing, right? These have equal standing to the little fact pieces that you're supposed to memorize. That's that's a game changer. That's a a, a game changer. Uh, Jack, I have to push back a little bit about the little facts thing. Yes. Just that that's not what we're supposed to be. Um, that isn't even a third. It's big ideas and forget the little itty bitty facts. What, well, are, the, what are the big themes? And, and they're not to memorize them, they're to figure them out. That, 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 that's right. I, I, I am, I'm doing <laughs> a, a kind of a, a disservice by, by oversimplifying here. Um, so Laura's... Um, Pointing out clearly that so the what are called the disciplinary core ideas um, of the of, of the, the the next generation science standards that is the sort of you can think of it sort of three ways like what is um, through the processes of science we've been able to figure out a lot of really useful stuff right and and so. These, those are what they call the, the disciplinary core ideas and, and, and getting some of these concepts and understanding of those scientific principles and that, yeah, that plant is actually getting energy from the sun and it's taking carbon out of the freaking air and turning it into the mass of the plant through this process. That's crazy. But so you still do want to be learning some, some, some concepts. Those are the disciplinary core ideas. Then you have the science and engineering practices, which is a separate third, and the um, and the cross cutting concepts, a full separate third. Um, but I was I was kind of belittling the uh, science and engineering practices, um, and and I and I don't mean to disrespect them. Um, I mean not the you know, not the science and engineering practices, I was belittling the disciplinary right. ideas. I th I think that if a bunch of us sat down and we were on our own to rewrite NGSS, we would come up with a lot of the same things. When I look down that list of um, science and engineering practices, um, it's a really solid list. There's one other that they didn't put in and they should have. And a lot of sort of professional edu educators have given them grief about this and they have kind of a dodge they, they say that, oh, that one, you know, just you should assume that that is, of course, in everything that we're doing. And that would be, how do you make observations, right? That I think that they're assuming that people can make observations, um, but it actually is a skill that we can develop. Um, but we I think the design and investigation has that, I've always seen it as part of it, but... Um, I get what you mean, though, because the very foundations of science have are, were those nature observations, right? That's that's a naturalist. That's how we got natural science. That's that's it was all about observing things carefully and closely and with consistency and um, and it is what we do with the elementary kids up until you know third or fourth grade. That's the primarily what they do is observation. It's not because they're not, you know, so anyway. Yeah. Be and you, no, you're, you're absolutely right, Laura. But, but also observation exists in science outside of mm -hmm. experiments, uh, uh, designing experiments. So um, if, so all of natural history is, you know, you're sitting on a stump and you're looking at what lizards do and then you're writing down, this is what lizards do. And then you end up knowing a lot more about what lizards do. Right, and so there is no experiment there. There is no hypothesis there. Oh well, we don't. Hypotheses aren't real anyway. But um... oh, oh, I, I, the, so the, the hypothesis is 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 real. The, the hypothesis is the could it be statements that we're using when we're using inference, right? Yes, I just meant in the in the uh, science pro in the process of doing science. It's not this the capital H hypothesis. Yes, yes. Thing. As a scientist practicing scientist, I never once woke up and said, my hypothesis for today is right. not once. Yeah. Um, but um, it's actually designing investigations. It's not designing experiments. Mm -hmm. So if you say, I'm going to go out and watch 
the lizards, that's an investigation. Okay, I, I agree. Yes. Um, so, um, and I've, actually, I think we should unpack that whole discussion on hypotheses and have that for a whole, like kind of the misconception of what hypothesis is and isn't and where it belongs and where it doesn't would be a really fun topic for a whole, for a whole session. Because mm -hmm. um, for sort of science literacy, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a key concept. Um, I'm going to jump over to the gallery and see if anybody's raising their hand who wants in on this. Um, I'm going to jump to Chris. Um, Chris, it's good to see Hi. you. Hi. I, uh, I would like to connect this to literature and the arts because I taught science first, but then I uh, started in later on, after like 18 years, I went into art and ceramics teaching and the kids journaled every, every piece of pottery they made. They recorded how they made it, what they hoped would happen, what glazes they used, you know, all this. And it involved uh, measuring um, all the things we do, but the phenomenon was, you know, what they're gonna throw on the wheel. And I think that that was um, the single most thing that helped their growth. If they were just messing around and not journaling and not paying attention to how high they could throw the cylinder and how much clay they used each time. That made a huge difference. In English, I used to connect um, with literature and I would set up, um, well, for instance, I'd set up a, a phenomenon for say Lord of the Flies. I actually dramatically turned off the lights in the room and said, you've all been in a plane crash. You're stranded on an island. Uh, and when I turned on the lights, they had to find other people and form a group of four or five. They had to inventory their own backpack and see whatever they had that they could use to survive on this island. And then they had to write a journal every day for a few minutes as a group and tell something about what they're doing in their group and what's happening to each person. And each person wrote their own journal of this activity. And it turned out to create great friendships that lasted for a long, long time. But the, the idea of journaling and, and having the freedom of starting with all these objects, it was just amazing. And I think that uh, we need to connect journaling to all the subjects, not just science. And that's the point I'm making. That, that's, a, that's a really uh, a key point there, Chris. Um, so when we, we sort of started off talking about nature journaling and like, how does this connect to science? So I noticed, I wonder, it reminds me of, you can use these prompts with- Anything. Everything, right? Anything and yeah. everything. And, um, and the process of journaling about something requires observation, thinking, reflection, right. and then pushing it back out, right? So you're going to take this in, mm -hmm. you're going to process it, and then you put it back out. In the Charlotte Mason education system, they talk about a, 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 a lot about this, this process of that you don't know something until you can really kind of take it in. It becomes yours when you can productively, meaningfully kind of let it back out as a narration. And narration mm -hmm. can be in the form of, of journaling, right? Or right. talking to somebody else. Yeah, um, storytelling. And mm -hmm. so this, these, these processes, journaling as a tool for thinking about, um, about the book, thinking about science, thinking about history, thinking about your own social emotional experience, thinking about th throwing clay. The journal is going to force you to attend and reflect in a way that we just don't get in other ways. Mm -hmm. So maybe what we can do is we can take down, it doesn't, does it have to be, <clears throat> do we have to think of this of, as, as nature journaling or but where could this sort of general journaling tool using the same mm -hmm. toolkits, you don't have to call it nature journaling, no. 
you know, you're now in the history class and they'd be like, why is nature journaling in the history class? Oh, we're just <laughs> journaling, right? <clears throat> yeah, I just um, call it noticing life. <laughs> yeah, um, but I mean, what powerful, powerful tools. So like kids who keep a diary are more socially, emotionally intelligent than kids who don't. Right. So maybe yep. more of that, right? <laughs> yeah. Very good point. So now we're so we're we're thinking now about you can have this sort of focused nature journaling activity, boom, and it can like lead off on a unit on science. You're saying mm, let's not just restrict that to science. Let's think about all these other areas. How can you use this journaling toolkit yeah. to get people to be present and to focus? Um, Ayoka is saying we're going to have this sort of visual thinking weaving through all our lessons. When I'm up there at the board, I'm drawing icons. I'm creating mm -hmm. visual maps of ideas and demonstrating by my own behavior how to do this. So um, the skills of graphic facilitation as part of a teacher's skill set, you're thinking like, but I don't know how to do that. Right. By the way, there's some there's some really cool books out there on graphic facilitation, um, and you you can check those out. An easy way to start is um, Ayoka talked about sketch noting, um, Mike Rohde's sketch note handbook, giving that big thumbs up. The sketch note workbook takes those ideas of sketch noting and applies them not just to I'm going to listen to this lecture and put down ideas in sketch noting, but to anything that you're thinking about from how do you make boba to how do you, you know, prepare for um, the, the trip that you're going on or to straight up nature journaling. So when Mike Rohde looks at nature journaling, he goes like, oh yeah, you guys are sketch noting. You're just out there in front of a nature phenomena and you're sketch noting that squirrel. We're gonna be doing sketch noting on squirrels. Um, Let's uh, jump back. I'm going to bring Aisha back in and add. Boom. Hi. Hey, thanks. Just to add on to that, that reminded me that we found um, sketch noting, if we're going to call it now, a great tool for our um, some of our kids with who are on the spectrum or uh, just with typical jumpy second graders who uh, there was no way they could sit for even a five minute <laughs> explanation of what was going to happen and just handing them paper or a dry erase board and a marker. And I'm like, you are going to draw what we're talking about for the next five, 10 minutes. You are my note taker and you're going to use words and pictures to whatever combo you want. Mind blowing. They were so into it and it totally changed our classroom dynamic um, so that we could carry on for 10 minutes. And, and it was actually cool to see. They were basically sketch noting, I realize, as you say. Um, so just wanted to throw that out there. It was, a, it was an awesome tool. Actually, we also started doing things. It also reminded me instead of broader skills for every subject area, because um, I teach a lot of art with natural materials too, is um, I just started throwing it out as a, a listening tool. Like I'm gonna talk about something or I'm gonna tell you a little story and I'm not gonna show you any images to go with it. I'm not gonna draw anything. You are gonna be drawing as we go uh, what I'm talking about or what you're imagining as I talk about. Um, and um, that was actually very powerful too. I saw a uh, really strong engagement when they could do that. And I, uh, I snuck in some other principles I needed to teach like adaptation and this and that. Um, but everybody was listening um, too, which, you know, is a huge skill we're trying to develop at school. It's not just talking when it's your turn and then not listening at any other point. And we started realizing as a school, we need to step back and actually concretely develop some listening. And for me, that was the way I went uh, as a teacher was like, that's all. That's, that's, this is, this is core. So lots of ways that these ideas can weave through what we're doing. And, and if you're doing that in your classroom, that's, 
that's transformative. And, and, and as, as a teacher, you say like, yeah, but I don't know how to do graphic facilitation. I don't have uh, any real kind of experience sketch noting. How am I gonna try that? Well, you know what? You're gonna be teaching in this classroom for the next three semesters. And so if you, when you're up at the board, just start kind of pushing yourself to take little experiments in sketch noting yourself, right? And visually doing that on the board, by the time you have done this for a full year, you're gonna be an amazing graphic facilitator. You'll be up there, you'll be talking about ideas. And at first people are kind of, the, the kind of that it kind of gives, makes people's brains boggle a little bit to be like making an icon or a drawing on the board and sort of talking and there's ideas all kind of going on at the same time. How can you do this? How can I listen and sketch notes or be teaching and sketch noting at the same time? You can, and but it's gonna take practice, but these students are, if you, if you do it a little bit and it's not perfect, that will be better than doing none of it, right? And so just you know, doing a little bit, you're, you've got, you can practice on them and you'll get better at it. I did it constantly as the only way to keep younger kids' attention. I had to be talking and drawing and I can't free draw. I got better at it, but also I invited them in to laugh with me. I'm like, what is that? What, what is that? Okay, you could probably draw it better, but that's my squirrel, okay? It's got an oval body and there's a bushy tail and, or use your imagination. And sometimes it was really handy. I'd be like, so we're talking about the forest ecosystem and here's a random mammal. I don't know how to draw it. It could be anything you guys want in your imagination. <laughs> So inviting them in and then it took the pressure off of them to be good drawers, the ones who were not. And there was always one volunteer who'd be like, I can draw it for you. And I'm like, yeah, later feel free to come and work well, on well, it. I just want to riff off that idea. So one of um, Mike Rohde's ideas that I got out of reading Sketchnote Handbook was, he says like, if there are a number of concepts that in your field are going to be showing up again and again and again and again and again and again, come up with an icon for that in advance, right? Nice. So let's say you're in your class and you're doing something, you're thinking like, all right, this idea of photosynthesis is going to be coming up a bunch in this lesson. Wouldn't it be nice to have a quick, easily drawn photosynthesis icon? So you can, during your break time, try to come up with one. Or here's what we're all going to do. So everybody, I'm now talking to all you. Imagine you're my students in my class. What we're going to do is I'm going to ask everybody to take 45 seconds, get a pencil and a piece of paper, and I'm going to ask, we're going to see who can come up with a really cool, simple, easy icon for photosynthesis photosynthesis, right? So, um, oh man, there's no pen in this room. I mean, um, oh no, here's the pens. All right, I'm gonna do this too. I've got, right? So everybody on your mark, get set. Everybody come up with a photosynthesis icon. Okay, so again, just a quick review. Photosynthesis is the process by which um, plants take sunlight energy and they convert it into sugars and it's taking carbon out of the atmosphere. It's turning it into, you don't have to, it doesn't have to represent all these ideas, right? Um, and it's done in a green pigment, the chlorophyll in the leaf, right? So with those ideas, get something down on your paper. Now, if it's too elaborate an icon, it won't be a useful icon. So icons are best when they're simple. You want something that you can just put down there. Now, notice 
I'm going to ask, I'm going to interrupt everybody's process here. Metacognitively, right now, everybody in this group is thinking about photosynthesis. What are key elements about that and how you would visually represent that, right? So your visual cortex is activated, right? And it's now wrapping around this idea of photosynthesis. Um, and gosh, I just wish I had a green marker. All right, does anybody want to share one, uh, a photosynthesis icon that they made? Oh, let's, let's, I'm going to start here. Um, uh, Ayoka, then we're going to go to Aisha. And um, so I'm going to drop me off here. I saw Laura had one too. Oh, all right. So check this out. We've got that leaf arrow coming in, arrow coming out. So there's carbon dioxide coming in. You've got oxygen going out. Um, you have, I mean, that's, that's cool. There's the sun icon in it. And then let's check out Aisha's. Um, so uh, talk us through that one. You are muted. Ah, there Trying we go. to find my unmute button. Ah. I forgot my carbon dioxide. Thank you, Ayoka. Uh, I've got my leaf only one time for one vein because it's an icon, a sun, a water drop, and carbon dioxide. And I love how that vein kind of connects into the sun. I mean, graphically, visually, it looks like a road to me, which makes me think a process and a journey. Oh, and the arrow is just suggesting, just having an arrow on it suggests that this is a process, an action, right? Even if that arrow doesn't specifically, it could mean, you know, oxygen. It could mean all sorts of different things. It could mean sunlight energy coming in. It could mean lots of different things, but it suggests process. That's cool. Um, who else has one that they want to share here? Um, I'm going to go to iPad. I don't know who iPad is. Let's see, uh, add spotlight right there. Check this out. Can you talk us through that? So I just drew the sun with um, sunbeams coming down and this little tiny plant coming up. There's the earth and then there's some root. Nice. But I like the other two better. <laughs> right. So. But, but notice how doing this got your brain just to squizzle around with those ideas and play with them, right? This idea yeah. of make an icon for this, that can be a class activity. Very cool. Who else yeah. wants to share one? <clears throat> it didn't take much time, did it? Just 45 seconds, we've got these icons. Oh, you, Debbie's got green. Ah, check that out. <laughs> oh, green marker. Show us what you've got again. I have many pens. Oh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. So you've got the leaf shape inside a sun, right? Yeah, sort of silhouette. So if this is going to be a, a, an, an icon that, so this would be easy to draw. And as you're going on in your notes, anytime photosynthesis is popping up, you know, you can draw this in the corner of the board. It's going to visually trigger everybody, person, kids in their notes, whenever they're kind of getting to something that's photosynthesis related, this little icon, boom, it pops into it. So you're teaching people how to create and use these icons. Um, let's see, I'm going to go for one more. Who else wanted to share one more photo? Oh, let's go to check out Loris. Uh, um, and that's not you have to Show do. Us what you've got. So this is this is a progression because um, I don't want to simplify, right? So <laughs> this one started with uh, carbon dioxide and water. A small plant goes to a bigger plant and oxygen, and then this and with the sun there, and then I went very simplistic. And for me, it's very important that you they recognize that um, it's the atoms that you put in that cause it to grow. Um, and that was like, eh, maybe not. And then uh, the, the, I like the water drop, so I incorporated that to do it this way. And I, you can't tell that it's got color, but um, that's as simple as I could, I could do it. 
But that's cool. That's fun. So you see, um, this, if, if you're thinking like, how would I visually represent this? You could just, anything time you're like, you're puzzled about how to, how do I sketch note that, turn it into a quick icon generation challenge for the students. And then you can start to use whatever icons you like that the students have generated. And think how the kid is going to feel if the next day when you're talking about photosynthesis, if they look up on the board as you start to talk about it, you draw their icon, the kid is gonna be like, I'm so down with photosynthesis. Right? Oh, but fun. Um, we're just about out of time here. I saw a moment ago that um, Ayoka had something to add into the flow of the conversation. I want to uh, jump over to her and then see if anybody has any other key ideas they want to drop in on this. Boy, this has been a productive conversation. Um, yes. I, I just love the conversation. Thank you so much. It's great. Uh, I wanted to add uh, two things. The one thing is that I actually do that in my workshops when I can't, can't, uh, I can't have, I don't have an idea to, for something. Like I, I have feedback group, um, group feedback rounds at the end of my sessions. Uh, if I don't know how to visualize a concept, I will just ask my participants and they come up with something. So that's oh, nice. Okay. And the other point I wanted to make, which is to me is really important. Um, as I've been using sketch noting in speech therapy, I've also worked with, uh, not, not with many, but with some stroke patients. And the one thing that I found, because you, you always think when you're listening in sketch noting, you have to be quick. But if you're teaching and sketch noting, it actually slows the process down a bit, which I think is amazing because it's not as you, you actually, it takes some time to, for you even to draw a simple icon. And then that time, the students or the listeners have time to really kind of mull on what's been said. And I, I love this. And you don't have to think you have to be quick and you don't have to be a good drawer. Like really, this is about communication. Think of it like speaking, speaking a foreign language. If you just use your hands and feet and you know the little bits that you know, you will communicate in some way and you can, that's totally enough to start. And, pictures are much easier to understand than the foreign language. Beautiful. Mm, mm. Let, let's bring Sharon in on this. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to remind everyone that um, we were introduced to the website, The Noun Project, that has, you just put into the search box what you, you, know, what you want to see an icon for, and it'll bring up all sorts of su suggestions. And um, if you're new to sketch noting, like sometimes just having um, some ideas to rely on um, to get you started, I think can be very helpful. Um, I uh, <clears throat> just have bookmarked the noun project over 3 million icons. So I'm going to type in photosynthesis. I'm going to, here, let, let's try this. <laughs> um, um, I am going to share my screen. Um, and uh, we're going to go over to the noun project. And um, let's type in photosynthesis. Uh, I'm dyslexic. How do you spell photosynthesis? And then after you already got it, it's E S I S, I think. Okay. Yes. All right. Let's see what they do. Come on. Well, it's 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 hard to sort through those three million. One hundred and twenty-one. Ah, oh, they're working the leaves. They're working the sun. They've got arrows, leaves, and suns. Hey, <laughs> um, they've got carbon and oxygen in the leaves. 
Oh, uh, how clever. <laughs> oh, what fun. So, yeah. You know, so my my last sort of thought in this, and then I think we, we do have to, to wrap for the day, um, is that if you were to do this, you're going to get better at this kind of visual thinking, and your students are too. You're giving them more resources to think with. The way you think with pictures is different than the way that you think with words. And if you just think with words, you don't have as much of your electric meat problem solving for you. Um, I often think about these meetings that I've been in where people are kind of stuck and they're working around some project and everything's kind of vague and we're not really getting anywhere. And then some kind of quiet person will kind of pull a napkin off the table and make a little diagram on it and then hold up the diagram and says, well, I kind of see it like this. Like you've actually got this part and this part and that's the output there. And everybody's like, and once one person makes this little icon, a little drawing of this idea, that little drawing on that napkin becomes what pushes the project forward. It becomes this sort of unifying idea because somebody turned it into an idea into a picture. And what I tell teachers is that this, the ability to do that, to kind of come up with a picture is a skill. And it's a skill that you can learn. And if you give that skill to your students, it's going to help them in all sorts of ways because the person who controls the napkin controls the meeting. So are you going to be just coasting on somebody else's napkin? Or if you can pull up, up the napkin and create your own in it, you can take, because that person could have made that little napkin drawing any number of ways. But the way that they chose it, to do it frames the conversation from that point forward. And that's the power of learning visual thinking. Um, thank you all for this engaging discussion. This is really motivating and exciting. And um, before I close here, I just want to check in with our community here. Is there anything else that somebody wanted to add um, uh, uh, to our discussion here before we close? I have a uh, picture to share. It's it's a photograph. It's not a drawing. If that would if that's quite uh, right. What, what we did this week in class, um, which they sketched this. But uh, let's see, share screen. And it says I can't yet. All right, um, multi participants uh, advanced um, advanced sharing options. Um, who can share? Um, all of us can share now. All right, you can now all share. I think that this is a um, safe to do that. Ah. Now I can't see what you can see, but that's okay. right, So we are seeing a screen with uh, three beans, um, one which is very sprouted, one is just starting. I also see a pod in the background with um, some beans inside of it. Yep, so this is a, a cranberry bean pod with the seed still attached. So you can tell that the this little the belly button is still attached to the pod. And then we can compare it to this, which has been soaked, but nothing has happened. And this one, which had just the teeniest thing coming out. And then uh, this one, and then we dissected them. And so we actually, uh, uh, I don't know if I, do I still have, let's see, uh, 
new share. Boom, 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 boom. Hmm. Mm -hmm. That doesn't. Uh, 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 we, we were using food coloring, but anyway, <laughs> um, kind of made a mess. But uh, I left them in the water, and uh, by cutting it in half, we were able to see the leaves on on this one, and. Um, in the couple of days, they've actually gotten uh, bigger. And so we, we've, we worked with uh, sketching, sketching these, but then trying to um, use observation techniques and make, look for patterns. Um, and they've, comparing these to the seeds that they're growing at home. And each group has, um, but a challenged question to the class with, um, we noticed and uh, this pattern, um, did you see it too? Mm -hmm. So, um, um, or a couple of them have things we noticed differences um, rather than similarities. But what did you observe? So, I don't know. It's, I got it to the blue food coloring to go up into the seedling. It's pretty cool. <laughs> so, um, anyway, um, so we have been not saying that the stuff that we're doing with the beans is part of the nature journal because I haven't always expected them to include everything. But I think when I do it next time, it's just going to be part of the nature journal instead of trying to explain that they could, you know, they could use the paper in the nature journal, but it's not the nature journal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, excellent. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, stop. Well, my friends, um, another great round with the Nature Journal Educators Forum. I'm gonna just drop over to my um, gallery page here and check you all out. Thank you so much. This is, this is why we do these workshops because when we take an idea and together we bounce it around like this, we get, that's just amazing, amazing ideas. Um, I respect and appreciate all of you, and I look forward to seeing all of you here, uh, here again soon. Thank you very much. Everyone be well, take care of each other, take care of yourself, and, um, and know that this community is, is here for you as you face challenges. Um, uh, let's brainstorm those together, and together we're gonna work out these best practices as educators and as parents, to, uh, to, to, to turn into these into just the, the, the best learning experiences that we can. Thank you again for all of your time, care and expertise.